What do you think? Does it make sense to you? It is interesting that there are not too many things have changed since then. Barat, yeah, Barat. Yeah. Uh, I like the way you explained uh, on the whiteboard about uh, the uh, uh, dependent origination and what is left of uh, in an arhat. So that was really uh, uh, very uh, uh, elucidating, you know, how the operation takes place in an arhat. I, I was not so clear about it earlier. So it became very, very clear today. Good. So, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> That's really yes. good. You are uh, really an expert with de dependent origination. <laughs> you yeah. can twist it in different ways and put it across in so many different ways that it's really wonderful. I, I really uh, liked how you expressed that whole thing. Now, coming back to the main topic of uh, money, you know, uh, money is uh, a source of craving. So, I, I, I don't know, whatever you do with it, uh, craving is bound to arise. You know, how can one be uh, neutral about it or uh, not have... Uh, is, is craving actually uh, bound to arise if the mind is trained enough? Can that's you... what my question is, yeah. So, well, that's why I said he knows pain is inevitable and the pushing of that coming up. But if you understand, you practice an impersonal perspective and... You don't take anything personal. You, you, you're you dismissing, I want, I like, I want, I go get. And, and you watch what happens. You, you know, I have taken people in New York, <laughs> many major cities in the world, and told them to go out and buy these little notebooks, a tiny little notebook, like smaller than your phone, and start writing down what happens when craving is happening. To, oh, I don't crave. I'm really good. I've been a Buddhist for years. I don't crave at all. <laughs> and then they start writing down what's happening. And some of the stories are great. One of the things is a, a man was in Maryland near the harbor in Baltimore. And they have one of these big uh, places where you get um, huge, I don't know what they're called, like pies, you know, uh, huge... Uh, sections of cake and pie and everything and he was really sweet tooth you know and so he says to his friends let's go down to the harbor and let's go to this place I forget the name it had to do with ice cream and cake and so they went and they got the cars and they angry at everybody in the house and pushing everybody around getting them in the cars and going down to the harbor and they forgot the whole place was shut down for the weekend <laughs> and he said everybody in the car was salivating like Pavlov's dog, we're going to that place. <laughs> and this is the craving. And you know, when, uh, you know, the Indian food is okay, but every once in a while, my body says, but what about, <laughs> what about pizza or something? <laughs> you know? And somebody will say, I'll get you a pizza. And then I am salivating the whole time they say pizza until they come to the door with the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, it's just so funny to watch your body automatically be this trained thing you've learned, you know. And the other thing is occasionally, um, we would normally in many places have a piece of chocolate in the afternoon, you know, when you're in temples and stuff. When um, I'm by myself, there's this not happening, it's not happening, <laughs> you know. And so all of a sudden, some, someone will bring me, say that I'm going to bring you chocolate. And for that day, I'm like, <laughs> thinking about the chocolate. I just bring a little tiny piece of chocolate and they give me a little tiny piece of chocolate and I'm there, oh my, <laughs> you know, I'm just so want that, I so badly want that piece of chocolate. Yeah, this craving is just natural. It's just <laughs> But when you're so my in point was, yeah, it turns right. off. Yeah. This turns off yeah. when you when you've gone all the way. It turns off. So, it's yeah. So my point was that uh, you uh, uh, earn money in the hard way, and you know, put in hard work and toy your day, and uh, then someone comes in and cheats you, and uh, 
uh, robs you of some uh, of that uh, hard earned uh, money uh, yeah. that is bound to uh, cause some heartburn isn't it you know <laughs> Um, there, there was an amazing thing that happened. I'll tell you a story and you'll just, you'll just wonder how we decided to handle this. I will tell you this story. A long time ago when we first got the center where it is right now, and this is like in 2003, I think, 2003, we were on the mountain for two years and then we came down to this property and, and uh, we had a caretaker that lived down the road and we thought he lived in a house. He just lived in a hut in the woods. So we asked him when we had to go on tour, the only way that we could have any money was if we went on tour to do retreat. That's the only way because no one was coming there. This is all forest. It's not cleared yet. The road's not built, nothing. So he, Bonte's living in a big trailer on the lower part of the land and I'm living in a small trailer on the upper part of the land. And it was like that for many, many years. Okay, this is how it all began. So we had this guy come and he's going to stay there for the, for, the winter, for the winter retreat while we go to Florida and we do retreats there and in several other states and come back to Missouri. So I even went, I bought him a chair, <laughs> this is funny story, a recliner to put in that little house that was on the property by Bonte's thing. And I said, you, you get the wood stove going, I'm sure you'll be okay. I got you a blanket. I got him cookies. I got him this chair for him to stay in. And this man had a little problem. He was had an addiction. It wasn't, wasn't gambling and it wasn't anything to do with, um, it was more like not really pornography. He was just lonely, really lonely from living where he lived in the woods. And we didn't realize his situation, his history or anything. So he decided to call people on the phone and talk to them on our phone. Yeah, <laughs> when we came back from these retreats, we started getting phone bills. $6,000, $8,000, $10,000, mm. up to $22,000 of phone calls for $3 a minute on these calls. And we were like, we don't have any money. They could take the, and then the, the phone company said, we can take your property. I say, no, you can't. And it's not going to happen, you know? So I had worked before in human rights for people who were disabled and stuff. And I said, we have to help this whole situation, but we have to do what's right for us. And so we found out the, the people, the phone companies that were involved, these places that were charging the phone company, see, they said that if we could prove that he should go to prison, if we would, if we would pursue the case and press charges and make this man go to prison, this poor disabled man to prison, that um, they would forgive us the amount that was, oh, that was what's happening. And the neighbors down the road, they got hit for 11,000. And they were in the county next to us. This is a true story, okay? And so, what happened was we decided, okay, we're going to press charges, but I'm, I'm going to step away. I'm going to handle advocacy with this man because I didn't trust what they would do to this man. I didn't trust it at all. And so, <laughs> and they said, they said to us after we put him in jail and, and the jail was just great for him. <laughs> thing they put him in jail in this little jail in a country town he had a roof for the winter he had everything he needed he had food he got to wear his little outfit and go get his own groceries and come back and stay in the jail for the for seven months before the trial and then they have us go in for the trial and when they go into the trial i see that what's going on and i i knew a lot i knew that they i couldn't get involved to a certain extent i knew he had two hernias in his body from working at the mill i knew he was disabled mentally now okay and i knew that they were giving him a public defender who had never been in court before and didn't know anything when I found out he didn't know anything at all about mentally disabled people. I was like, they said we couldn't talk to him or approach him after we put press charges against him. We weren't allowed to do it. So I demanded an audience with the judge. And I went in and uh, took the prosecutor in with me. 
and uh, I said, this man, he doesn't understand anything that's happening to him. He kept saying to anybody, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know what I've done. It couldn't have been that much money. <laughs> I was just on the phone. <laughs> and he didn't even realize it was $22,000. They could have taken the whole place away from him. And this was like a, a test in front of me. Like if I'm doing this right, the universe is going to support me. I was sure of it. And he was convicted, but I was involved. And when I saw something going wrong in the trial, I stopped the trial. Excuse me. <laughs> Live to speak to the judge. <laughs> I couldn't speak to the judge. And I convinced them to bring in the welfare service and do a complete welfare evaluation on this man. And they did an examination and found out, yes, he is partially retarded. Yes, he is mentally disabled. Yes, he wasn't, he was, you know, all this stuff is proven by the, by the, by the examination on him. And I said, okay, that's out of the way. Now, what are you going to do about the defender? He said, well, he'll sit and talk to him. I said, you know, you, you have to, I said, you cut me away from this and you say, the, the, the center and the other people are involved, but I'm not part of this. I have to be sitting with him. He's not going to understand anything that the lawyer says to him. Nothing. Because I know how that works. Those public defenders just want to roll over the person and say, yes, we got a conviction. <laughs> that's all they want to do. Yes, I did my free duty. And that's all they want to do. And so it's really awful. So I, I, they did this examination, then they, they took him and they convicted him and they gave him seven months credit for his term in jail, three years, he got three years, and it was a second felony, so we knew he wasn't going to be in there forever, but then he had to go to the hospital and there were three hernias, three hernias, a hiatal hernia, mid hernia, and a lower hernia. Can you imagine from working at the mill that he never fixed? And after that, they put him in, um, they, they said he's too sick to go to jail. We're going to put him in a housing thing. And they put him in a housing compound where there were other people like that on the edge of the town. And then the woman he was calling on the phone, she came to visit him. <laughs> she liked him. <laughs> she stayed with him. And I was, if I passed him on the street, I was not allowed. I could be sued by law if I if I talked to him at all, because I was involved in his his, his prosecution. And he writes me this letter says, I want to thank you so much. <laughs> I said, this was like a golden parachute for him. We didn't have to pay the money. We kept the land. It, can you imagine how this all worked out? I still don't understand. <laughs> Except that I was clear I was not going to get angry about this because I knew something was wrong. And when we went to check where that man lived, you had plastic sheeting tied between around five trees and two pieces of plastic sheeting taped so it wouldn't leak across the top. And inside the plastic black tarp, you know, black plastic, there was a small wood stove to keep warm and he lived near a creek. So he was drinking that water, which is part of the reason he was sick because we have all kinds of bovine fever coming in the water in the streams in that area from the pigs, wild pigs. And look at this whole story. But I decided, let's just see, let's just see how far it will go. If I don't take anything personally, <laughs> that was a big step, you know, because <laughs> $22,000 breathing down on your head and, and see how far I can take this without stepping out of the law. How far can I go? And I had fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that. But we didn't lose the place. We kept the place, you see. And look at that. That's a lot of money. That's not just a little bit of money. And um, they, they didn't I don't know what happened in the other county, to be honest, with the other 11,000. I'm not sure what happened with the other neighbors that got hit with this also. Same problem. He ends up with somebody to, to live with him. I don't know if they got married, but they lived together in a tiny apartment, and they were there for many years. <laughs> it's your choice. It's your choice. You see, the problem is you don't believe that the universe possibly is structured where it will support you you have to surrender to that the universe supports me 
not because I'm magic or holy or anything else. I just decided one day that the whole structure of the human race is that the universe does support us, but we have to surrender to the universal laws. And one of the universal laws is if you are angry and angry at that man and you're yelling and screaming and you're doing everything on the wrong side of the street, none of that would have happened the way it happened. Nothing would have happened like that. And we probably would have lost the land. And Bhante just stepped back and said, you know enough to get through this. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew it was a big test. <laughs> you know, so I just kept going. That is a true story. See? That's the, uh, amazing. But this is, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, it was interesting to hear the story. And it's a true story, obviously. But this is not really cheating. You know, cheating is when somebody's, you know, really planning against you to cheat, to rob you of your money. Mm. <laughs> a lot of that on the internet, okay? A friend of mine put up $10,000 to set up a store online. This guy was going to teach her how to set the store up online. She took $10,000 of her inheritance and put it into it and lost it in one week. Just like that. This guy just disappeared. She realized there was something wrong and went to the Justice Department. No one could even find him anymore on the internet. Because it was like, and she said, he said one thing to me on the phone and one thing only. This is the easiest $10,000 I've ever made. Click. And that was it. Gone. Just like that. How about that? That's a chunk too, you know? <laughs> So we have to be really extremely careful with anything that we do on the internet. We don't know anything, but that's just one step beyond in this society, you're still in a face-to-face. -face, um, a lot of face-to-face -face stuff is still going on in this society. I, I like it better because of that. <laughs> there's too much uh, having the computer swallow people in the United States. But swindling works even faster where you can't even see a trace of the person left. His email account disappeared. His website was gone in 20 minutes after he had that $10,000 in his hand. That's how fast. And she didn't move fast enough to stop that check. She was a big heart person. <laughs> I said, you move. And she, oh, no, no, it can't be. It can't be. I've been talking to him for a week. <laughs> and that's a professional swindler just like that. See? Yeah. <laughs> we have to let go. You okay. have to. But the universal laws, the, the universe has ways of helping you and telling you the, the lessons of manifestation are still here. But in order for you to manifest exactly what you want to have happen, you have to have a dream first. You have to have the picture of it in your mind. And then you can make a model of it and clay and put it on a table. And then you think about it all the time and see it already has happened. And then all of a sudden, something happens where things start clicking into place. And people start coming to help you make that happen. You know, this is the, this is the uh, issues that you have to look at when you're building something. Yeah. You know? And things, things happen differently. You know, with most of the meditation, for instance, in the world, 125, 150, 175 people in a, in a place for a retreat, they do that. And so to be a teacher, you sit there and you speak a little bit and everybody's not talking. And then you say one, you give one little talk and that's it and go away. And there's no interviews. You, you might see that teacher once or twice in 30 days, maybe. But there's no systematic interviewing. But what we're doing is so specialized that we don't even conceive. We couldn't even conceive of going over 30 or 35 people. Now we've done 50, 55 people. And in Korea, we did 70 and 75. But we had to interview four people on a floor in front of Bonte at one time and make them swear that they would not talk about what goes on in that room the rest of the day to anyone. And then they would sit at lunch and talk to each other. <laughs> See, people are just, um, yeah, <laughs> so like, you know, you have to, you can't tell what they're going to do when you try to organize it. But you go one little step off, you know, when I say to you that there's eight sub eight topics, 
that we know if those eight topics are connected in a retreat for about 10 days, that you can stay on this line, absolutely stay on it for that period of time where you are moving across that line. Well, that's not it. There's the car. <laughs> it's moving across. It's moving along that line and it's not going to fall off. And our job as a guide, we only job we have as a guide is to interview you each day with the same set of questions to see where you fall through the floor, you fall through the hole and catch you and put you back up here because you fall off. And we know if you come in there and you say to us, yeah, I can, I did the six art. What did you do? You're not allowed to answer that question and say, I six art. I asked you, what did you do when you were pulled away by the distraction. Tell me in your own words, what did you do? Tell me right now without thinking. And, and you may not say I six hard. I, and you, you know, you're, it's not acceptable as an answer on the forms that we did. It was a big mistake and it's just not, it's not acceptable. So, because why? Because I need to hear you say that I said, never mind, and I let go, relax, smile, come back. Or I need to know that your mind is starting to automatically recognize that you're caught and then let go, relax, smile, and come back. But you can't say, I let go, relax, come back. Or I let go and I smiled and came back. You can't do that. Or I smiled and came back. <laughs> <laughs> and that there you're telling me that you're not progressing the moment you do that you're telling i know you're not progressing because these pieces are so important and so specific if you change them in your own words if you do and it doesn't mean exactly the same thing like when i say never mind it triggers the let go never mind let go relax smile come back recognize release and then relax and smile and come back. But if you go anywhere else, it's like changing the, the instructions for specific ingredients in a very special kind of pastry mixing, making or, or baking or some kind of recipe. And the recipe doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, you know, you run into people uh, but I did this in my last, this, I did this before and I want to do this too. And I want to, that's what you say is okay. You're in a retreat with me and you say, well, what, what you say is okay, but I was doing this and this and this, and I want to put that in with this, go ahead, but nothing's going to change. It's not going to work. And well, how do you know? Because I've been doing it for 21 years <laughs> and I've been watching all of those retreats up until 2014, I was on every single one of the retreats and workshops and talks and advising and discussions and everything where he was through the whole entire thing in every country, everywhere. And I'm telling you the truth. This is so specific. It is silly, simple. But if you fool around with it, it doesn't work. So if it's not working, you need to back up, listen to the instructions again. We tell people this all the time and just listen very carefully. And the one thing that's supposed to be in those instructions, there's 12 minute instructions, is you're supposed to hear the word smile 13 or 14 times in that 12 minutes that I give you those instructions. Yeah, we just did it. We just did another booklet this week for the Brahma Viharas for everybody. No matter who you are, what you are, where you are, it's the Brahma Viharas for everybody. And in this one, the person who set up the layout, <laughs> she put, because I was talking to her about the smiles and she said, okay. And she put it in bright, hot pink letters throughout the whole set of directions is the smile, 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 smile. Yeah. Why? Because this is, this uh, is, this muscle here when it pulls and it's by the way it's not here you know i found that out it's not here it's actually here where you feel it so you go ahead and smile you feel it in your cheeks right away so that muscle on the picture of the muscular um, muscular structure it runs from right here under on that bone under your eye down to the corner of your mouth here and i'll tell you a secret for women 
if you keep smiling, you won't grow old. <laughs> so these, your muscles are all going to be developed. Like I had kept singing or something. Cause when you sing, you open your mouth, like, ah, you know, like, that. and th these are tense, but I stopped singing. I stopped singing. Okay. Now, but I can smile. You keep smiling. It's never, your face is never going to drop. You may get a little bit down here, but you know, <laughs> it's not going to do anything up here, you know? So you wear a scarf, it's really easy. You know, I just go like this, right? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> In the 17, 1800s, they didn't have tummy tucks. They had corsets. <laughs> and you know, they didn't, the men didn't worry about their chins dropping because they were wrapping scarves around them in the 1700s. You know, if you look at the men. So there wasn't any fuss about any of this back then. So anyway, that's the story about that. Harrell, what did you have in mind? <laughs> what did you think about? Yes, I was. I, I wanted to, uh, you know, also repeat what Bharat said that uh, you know the wheels of the dependent origination that you showed today, absolutely excellent. Uh, but there was one observation that I I made um, that I want to make is that when you said about you know the anatta perspective and. Um, when, you, when we say, this is not mine, this is not who I am, this is not myself, um, I thought it is more applicable. Uh, so if, say we, you know, when you, what you said was that uh, when, suppose we break a precept or do something and then we uh, learn to forgive ourselves so you don't end up feeling very guilty. When you say, this is not who I am, this is not mine, this is not who I am, this is not myself. Um, doesn't that make you complacent no. in the sense, you know, you make mistakes and then you just keep forgiving yourself? No, 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 when, no, because, um, this is a, let's go, let's go in the board for just a minute. I think I can do it there. So we'll take it here. Anybody want a picture of this? You should click now or forever stop clicking. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to clear now. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is the deal of the unwholesome. Okay, the unwholesome and the wholesome. And then here, these are the, these are the precepts, you know, the precepts are here. And they try to keep a, ba a balanced barrier here. Okay. And you want, you have to test this for yourself. When you start testing this, you know, this is a W. <laughs> when you start testing this, that's what the, the um, that is what the Dwayda Vitaka Sutta is about, is about he was testing, what's it like to just live over here and break the precepts and how does my life go and what happens? And that's what this lesson was talking about. If you're dealing with the unwholesome things over here, this is not like uh, a feeling guilty time. This is like operations time. That's the way I look at this whole thing. You know, it's not the normal way that people look at this whole thing, but, but we're talking an operative thing when we're talking about the operation of the human being. And, and one of the things is you want to be happy, okay? But happiness is um, a trickster. I call happiness a trickster. You know why? Because happiness is looked at in our society. It is look, books about how to be happy, get happiness, keep happiness, all that stuff, right? But happiness is a, not a product. This is the joke on us. It is a byproduct of the way you live. Happiness happens over here. Happiness happens and happiness can hang around. But I can't go over here and say, I want this. It's in a box. Tell me how much it is. I'd like to purchase it. No, because it's a byproduct of keeping these intact and you will end up with happiness. The Buddha figured this out and he said, let's not talk about this. Everybody wants to have happiness, get happiness, control happiness. They want to force happiness on people. No, no, and give you pills to be happy and then let you break these precepts. This is crazy that this happens. When all you have to do is embrace the moral system here that is just an operative system. He didn't go very far with it. Let's, let's actually be real here. You know, this one down here is an added bonus. 
just so that you don't break these four. He gave you four precepts, that's all. A monk has 300 and some, pre, or one, the nuns have 300 and something like 320 or something like that. And the, and the men 285 or something like that. You know, so when you're talking rules and regulations or anything, bless my heart, this is nothing. <laughs> You know, don't be mean, <laughs> don't hurt anything intentionally, don't, you know, morally do something that causes his whole structure in these. If you tear the, sit down with a piece of paper and write your five precepts on it. And then under each one, tell me how it uh, works with the human being. You see? Okay, what happens? In other words, um, the, the, the underlying uh, deductive reasoning to the thing is don't do anything that causes pain and suffering to yourself or anyone else. That's the underlying key for this whole thing is that statement right there. Don't do anything that will cause pain and suffering. Okay, pain, two types, physical or mental. That means uh, to yourself or anyone else, fooling around with somebody who's living with their parents is not going to just hurt that person if they don't want to do that, do something with you. It's going to hurt the parents, the grandparents, your parents, their grandparents. If you really love the person, then you're in real trouble. Because if you get married, you're going to have a miserable life with your in-laws because you broke this apart too soon before you were married. You know, this is, this is a bad deal. This is where I don't believe that, you know, cohabitating and everything is such a great idea. <laughs> I mean, I'm from the 60s, but I don't believe that this is the real answer. And it's not about being your individual person, just doing your own thing. I think it's the lack of reasonable respect of looking at how many people get damaged in a situation when you're in doing relationships with people. And that's what the Buddha was looking at. You see, and he wanted to protect you, and sh but not he's not protecting you. You're protecting yourself. You, you work these over here operationally. You do your own experiment. Then everything's going to be all right, and this is the bonus, happiness and tranquility and joy. And Buddha's happiness is really nice. It's really, really nice. And you're going to have to put me on 75 instead of normal speed. <laughs> I just realized that I'm going way too fast. Okay. But always remember, you can listen to my talks at 75 and the speed of the talk instead where the little control setting is instead of normal speed. And you will be delighted as I explain the wholesome and the unwholesome situation that way. Yeah, you will. <laughs> and you'll be able to write down everything I say. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. But come over to the unwholesome, and then you have all the stories of what goes around comes around, what you put out, you get back, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And some people over here like to say, do unto others before they do it to you <laughs> in, in business. <laughs> That's really nasty. Do unto others before they do it to you. No, come on. Look, the guy who really has the business that's been there forever, everybody loves the stores the way it used to be before the big stores took over a lot of stuff and made this go away. But the good merchant was the one where the customers loved the store and the products and they never sold them anything that was gonna break in two days and you couldn't return it. You see, that's a big deal. Nowadays, everything is do it to them before you do, they do it to me type stuff. And the competition, and in 1975, I tracked this down. It's an interesting thing for you, Perel, okay? In 1975, on TV, the first time I ever saw two things happen. One was the sale of a, I can't remember, it was a drug that was by prescription only, and it was going on sale across the counter. And um, they started selling on TV. In 1975, they got legalized to sell drugs on TV, pushed on people. The big one is Zoloft because Zoloft will help you to lose weight. So everybody wanted Zoloft, whether they were depressed or not. And they, they, it drove the doctors crazy for people to line up and go to get 
tell their doctors, don't examine me. I want Zoloft. <laughs> you see why? Because my friend has it and she's lost 40 pounds and I want Zoloft, but you're not depressed. I don't care. I want Zoloft. You see what was happening? It was, it was ridiculous. And then, and then the other thing that happened was on commercials on TV, I was traveling. I can't remember. I think I was working in Washington or something when this happened. All of a sudden, I turned a TV on one night and in the advertisements for uh, cookies and pretzels and treats that you eat while you're watching TV with your parents or something, the father and the son was hide it from mommy. Don't let her have any. Keep it away from your brother. Don't tell him I gave it to you. All these dishonest little quips started happening and infecting the society. From that point on, it was perfectly legal to have, uh, you couldn't have a story in a movie eventually where there wasn't a liar, cheater, and thief, you see? And there was a lot of violence that was unnecessary and a lot of bad stuff with relationships that was unnecessary. The, the, it just has gone downhill. And it's affecting the whole entire society because we don't really, you know, it's not a subject for us right now. But anyway, this, this, is what, this is what I'm saying. Live here for a while. Don't listen to me. And then live here for a few days or something and see where it goes. It's not a happy ending, you see? When you're on the unwholesome side and you're not on the, on the wholesome side, see? One person said, well, what am I supposed to do? And there's a movie where the Germans come to the door, the, the, you know, the bad guys come to the door and they wanna know if you're hiding the other people. And uh, they were hiding the family in the basement, but they wanted the daughter uh, to, um, to get uh, free. And they had put her out the back door and told her to run across the field. They shot her and she died, you know, but the thing was the question from that film came, the man who was trying to be good and wholesome, was he supposed to lie at the door and say, no, they're not here? Or was he supposed to tell the truth and say that they were there? What is he supposed to do? Is he supposed to tell the truth or is he supposed to lie? When you, you and I both know that when he came to the door, he came to kill everybody in the house. And the answer to that precept issue was, no, he's not here, meaning he's not right here in front of your nose. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so he didn't have to lie. So he just said, no, he, not here. Then later he can say, well, I didn't know what you meant by here. <laughs> they probably shoot him then. But this is, the violence is just uh, really sad, you know, what's with there and stuff with, with everything. Now, dependent origination, I showed it to you this way, but I can also, I'll show you the pictures of the wheels. I haven't done that in a long time. I did these sketches of the wheels that explained how a person changes when they're using the seven links of dependent origination. When you listen to us teach it to you in, in the um, Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta, the number 38, you know, when you listen to that, which Sunny, the, uh, the son of the fisherman, Sati, son of the fisherman, that, that sutta, okay, you hear us go forward to how the suffering comes up, and you hear us say, if this doesn't come up, this won't come up. If this doesn't come up, this won't come up. If this doesn't come up, that won't come up. And we say, that's how the cessation occurs. But when you go into the, into the Samyutta Nikaya, something interesting happens. There is a definitive discussion the Buddha has in several suttas. The correct way to, to teach dependent origination and the incorrect way. And the correct way to teach it is to teach cessation to the people. Teach cessation. Do not just sit there and talk about suffering, but teach the cessation. And if we don't teach the cessation to you, you never get how you actually heal. So we teach the cessation slightly different mm -hmm, because I started examining people that uh, watching very closely and trying to keep track of how is this man healing from his anger problem or from his happiness thing or from whatever he's working on? How is he actually healing as an addict? How is he 
how is he healing? And so this is this, I'll show you very quickly how it works. Okay, let's get rid of this. Whoops. Okay, and you have it here. Okay, and you have um, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth of action, and sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So here you have um, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, um, whoops, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Yeah, right, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency, birth, and then the, um, the last one, the aging and death of the event of the event. Now, suppose the event is anger and the dangerous part for you as a psychologist, okay, a psychiatrist, you know, the danger part of the, of the thing is here. This is where the damage happens. When he bursts out and he's angry, this is the birth of the ang anger, okay? But what happens before that? And if we wanna manage the person's anger, teach him how to manage it, how do we teach him? First, we explain uh, these six sense doors, we can put this one on here too. The six sense doors are here, okay? And then contact happens. So this person, um, you know, he hears somebody, we'll say sound, okay? So this is an ear and the sound and the ear consciousness and then contact happens. And once contact happens, he has a painful feeling, right? And then I don't like it is the craving kicking in i don't like this and the clinging is why not <laughs> why not is the story about why you don't like it and you hate it and you're angry about it and what is your habitual reaction and we can say this is habitual emotional reaction and that sits right here, your habitual tendency. So this is where your reaction is a uh, reaction library. And these are the all from the past. They're all from the past events. And when this guy gets triggered for his anger, he hears something that is similar from something that happened in the past, sounds similar, the tone sound, the anger sounds, the accent, everything, and immediately trips off what? Restimulation of a reaction. That's what it does. Restimulation. And here's where it's restimulate. This is the birth, but it's a birth of restimulation reaction. That's what this is. Restimulation reaction. Okay. And then it happens in the other person's face. And then what happens is you have a period of the event, the aging of the event is going on where there's a, a, about a hundred more of these little circles spinning around where the person scream back and they go back and forth and now they're at war and finally it tones down. And then after the aging and death of the event, then there is this sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. See that? Okay, now how are we gonna heal this person? Are we gonna go back here and say, but if this doesn't happen, that doesn't happen, da 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 da? No, when I learned, I asked them to explain to me in New York, the man who used to be so angry at those people who harassed him and his wife on the street when they took a walk and they'd come in a van and they'd harass him, okay? What happened to you? How did you heal? He said, it was the craziest thing. I decided, I kept going over this chart again and again and again, like I did when I learned it again and again and again, drilling myself until one day he's out there and he sent loving kindness to them instead of getting angry when they started cussing at him. And he just wished them happiness and they drove away upset because he wasn't upset is what happened, okay? So how did it happen, I said? Well, he said, I I kept track in the little book and I saw that every single time it happens, it happens exactly the same way. 
somebody says something and there's the contact, the painful feeling, I don't like it. I don't like it because it's like all the other things in the past, blah, 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 blah. You know, all the past, past memories, okay? And then all the things I did when those things happened, those are living here in my reaction library. And I always did it the same way every single time I got mad at them. I was like a, a record just doing it, caught in a loop, doing it again and again. I decided this. I decided no more am I going to say it back to them. That was the first thing I did. Then the second thing is, I before I decided to do that, I wanted to close my library, just close my library. I closed it. So now I don't have a library to draw a reaction out of anymore, he said. So now when they say it to me and I hear it and a painful feeling comes up and I don't like it, well, I might not be able to stop that one, but I can sure stop running the story anymore because I know it's all coming from these old things that happened before. So I closed down this, I closed down this, I closed down this, he gave it to me in an email. He said, I only had to deal with, I don't, and I could probably let go of it. <laughs> I didn't have to say, I don't like it. I, I was got, I, oh, I, I let go. And most of the time now, and he's not attaining attainments, he's curing himself. But how did he do this? Are you getting it? How did he do it? Okay, he did it in the other direction, this direction. He did it like that, going backwards and eliminating one by one so that he never had the birth of action and therefore he never had any of this happening here anymore. He, he just jumped from however, wherever he stopped, he jumped into another position and he made another one of these start happening over here, but they were way out, not involving these anymore. And eventually he was only working with this. That's what he works with. And most of the time he does not crave, he laughs at himself because he knows the moment he feels like his craving is coming up, the best thing to do is laugh. Oh, it caught me. <laughs> look at that it caught me and I missed I have another married couple that used to pick on each other all the time and they started playing the craving game that I gave them and they would stand in the kitchen and start picking at each other and then they'd start to see who could catch who craving sooner and then they'd, they'd say one for me one for you one for me and they'd play a game until they were just laughing crazy laughing fun because it was all stupid picking on each other all the time you know yeah, we were just doing that for fun. I said, Blake, I've been in the kitchen when you're doing that. It's not fun. <laughs> you know? So you you one thing Vanti says about all of this, and you all should keep this in mind. How do we measure your success at changing a habitual tendency? How do we do it? By the level of your sense of humor about this whole entire thing. <laughs> That's what it tells me. And I'm there, yeah, it's right. Because as soon as I'm caught, the moment I'm caught in, oh, you know, I start laughing. <laughs> and the moment you're angry, the, the one thing that's true, and you can test it with any client you have, the moment you feel angry, you need to start laughing that you just got caught by anger that just caught you, you know, and you have to start laughing and really sincerely laugh and take the counterpart and say, this just isn't that serious because if it's going to change in 10 minutes if I don't like where I am. Uh, one, one young woman asked me in a big house where I, 35 people in the family were there and they decided to let the, high, the, the college kids ask the questions. And the one thing that happened was I was sitting there and the first question this girl said, I, I guess I am. I said, go ahead, ask the questions. I said, who are you? And she said, my name is Isabel. How old are you? 17. And then I said, so what's going on? She says, me and my mother, we have some issues. <laughs> she says, we have some problems, you know, there's some problems going on. And the thing was, I said, well, so what is it? And then I, she, she went off. I don't like this and I don't like that. And I don't like it when she asked me to do this and I don't like it that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I said, you know, you just said I 23 times. 
And if you don't like something, you say, well, what should I do? What should I do? I said, wait 10 minutes. Next question. And she said, wait a minute. You said you were going to answer my question. I said, I did answer your question. Well, what did you say? I said, when you're really uptight about what's happening, just wait 10 minutes and see whether everything changes because of a Nietzsche. Nothing is staying the same. All the time things can change and you can contribute to them changing. And she got this funny look in her face and her mother was sitting beside her going, hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, uh, it is already one hour, 45 minutes. So we have <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I bet you didn't stop it when we finished the talk, did you either? No. Okay. You can cut it, you can cut it off. All right. So anyway, we should, we should chop this in half. So we have one hour and then we have another half hour for, for was a good plan. It was a good plan. Somebody told me they were, they were disgusted with failure the other day. And I said, why are you so upset? Because of failure. Because failure is a terrible thing. And I said, what do you mean it's a terrible thing? So it's a horrible thing to fail. I said, why? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, first of all, if you fail at something, uh, you had to say, I did get some of it right. That was good. <laughs> okay. So let's take the teacup and go back to the teacup and say, here's a half a full, full of tea right now. Oh, is it half full or is it half empty? Do you know? He said, well, it's half empty. I said, well, you would say that. I would say it's half full. You see? So what, what are we looking at here? Start with the teacup. Now look at your own situation. Failure is, is, means that you have a chance to do it right next time because you see what you did wrong now you can do it better so it's a stepping stone to being successful instead of failing you need to look at it as a step in the right direction you see that so what is that that's a different perspective so i'll leave you guys with that did anybody else have a question i have a feeling they need to <laughs> Oh, There's a question somebody had sent me uh, before the talk. Uh, you want to answer that? Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is about the Sikologa Sutta itself, about wealth. What is the reason we cannot accumulate wealth or seem to lose it often either to family or friends or other means? Is it due to karma? Is it a lack of knowledge in practicing the Sikologa the Sutta advice or breaking precepts in the past? Well, they needed to come to the class because we just told you all the reasons why you lose it, didn't we? So why didn't they come to the class is the question that they need to consider. Time zones. <laughs> yes, we just gave them, I'm not sure, but I think there's close to 50 different things here that explain um, how you squander your wealth and lose your wealth, how it happens. And what they're forgetting, what they're basically forgetting is people who start saying, well, oh, it's my karma. They forget that in this life, you are continually doing action and creating karma. Karma is means, a funny thing, <laughs> karma means action. And every day you are creating action and that action is compounding. So rather than sit and get upset and want to say, well, it was the fault of my past karma, why don't we look in the present time and say, let's create new karma? Oh, how do you do that? Well, what you think and ponder on, that creates the inclination of your mind. And your mind leads to physical and physical action, verbal and physical action. It starts with an idea, a thought, and an intention, and the direction you choose. So you build your own karma. You, and, cannot, uh, blame, you cannot blame the, what I realized after years and years. You cannot blame anybody. You got on the ship in this life, and when you walked out away from your parents, nobody's up there trying to steer that ship but you. And nobody's going to come in your whole life to steer that ship. So it's a good idea for you to come and talk to people like us about how it's all working. Because we don't want to recruit you. We don't care if you're Buddhist, Hindu, pink, green, yellow. I don't care what you are. 
as a human being, how you work and operate from here into your mm -hmm. life and action, that all is up to you. And each okay. and one more thing, uh, I think Ulysses okay. also had a, a question. So does he want to ask? Yep. What was it? Who? Ulysses, I had a question, I think so. Ulysses, go. Ulysses. Ulysses? Ulysses is there? <laughs> <I'm just leaving. laughs> he just stepped out. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry. I, I it, it got answered. It's okay. all right. Okay. I'll get that. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Steve, did you have a question? I didn't remember. Uh, no, I don't have a question, Sister Kama. You're okay? Okay. Did this work out okay for you, Steve? Understanding all of this stuff? Yeah? Yeah, I think so. I'll probably rewatch it again. Okay. It's a go around, go around thing. <laughs> you gotta keep, you have to brainwash yourself <laughs> with the, brainwash yourself with the dependent origination. Literally, write it on a napkin. Write it on the next napkin. Write it on the back of the message you wrote at the office. Write it beside the phone. Put it on the door. Yeah. You know, until you really have it in there. And then you're going to start seeing it happen. That's the way this stuff works. Okay. All right. Let's go. May suffering. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fears shed fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long perfect the Buddha's dispensations. Uh, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.